Rock. The Rock Pile Report. The pettiest, hardest drinking Bills podcast. Welcome everybody to another edition of the Rock Pile Report podcast, but not just any edition. It is the what feels like 45th annual draft reaction podcast with Nathan P. Geary from WGR 550. Now, I assume the P stands for... Pro-Am. Does he... Well, he's dressed like... Patronizing. He literally looks like he just came from a Pro-Am. Thank you. Like, I I was like, oh, what event were you at earlier? He goes, oh, no, it was just a brewery. (laughs) Dude literally walks around like he just came from the Just in case (laughs) someone offers me an opportunity to play at a country club, I gotta be ready. I love how this is how he chooses to live. He's like, hey, whoa, I stay stay country club ready. Uh Some guys drive around with weapons in their vehicles because they go, well, I gotta stay stay ready. I got 14 weapons in the back of my car right now. (laughs) Different lengths, different different degrees. I love it. I love that that's what you stay ready for. (laughs) Guys, this might be my favorite draft in a long time. In a long, long time. Chris will freak out if you don't throw a coaster. I was going to say something, but... It it might be my favorite draft in a while, and and I'll tell you why. Right? Knee-jerk reactions abound. Raging debates. You get everything you want out of here. Hilariously flawed hills for people to choose to die on. This draft had everything you want if you're a jerk off like me. <laughs> like it had everything you could ask for. And it's been a lot of fun to watch unfold. Way more fun than I thought it would be last week when I told everybody that I think the draft sucks and I'm sick of it. Mm. Now, yet here we are. Are you happy that it's over? I'm thrilled that it's over. It, it's easier to pick through the wreckage of something than it is. I think to... it was 15, 15 hours of on air for me. And uh, Chris, do you have that drop queued up for me? What one? Please tell me to the uh, the old truck tire, because uh, I, I want I want you to hear this firsthand because I got a live recording of what it was like at Jeremy White's draft party. Oh, were you there? There? No, no, oh. we were there, but we weren't there. But we got audio from it as the night unfolded. There's a clip. And your family screaming, oh my God, we're burning alive. No, I can't feel my legs. It comes comes a meat meat wagon. wagon. And the medic gets out and says, oh my God. New guy's in the corner puking his brains out. (laughs) Oh my God, what a, that was good. Is this not the most fitting end for things for a, Fans of a football team who have driven themselves, to your point, like to the point of caricature over what they perceived as a draft need, only to have the team go, nah, (laughs) (laughs) nah, (laughs) is this not the most fitting end to the wide receiver, to the wide receiver draft train? (sighs) Yeah, I mean, I sat here on the show two weeks ago and I said... You never go you never go full wide receiver train, right? Because you just never know. What I, I said something pretty profound as well. And it was that no matter who was picked, that everyone would actually, would everyone actually, would love it. We actually have that audio. Do oh, you want to hear it? I do. Chris Ryan. I that think back. everyone needs to be more open to there being other ways than the way you want to think this thing's going to happen. And can I tell you that if the Bills decided at 28 to take a center from Oregon or to take a corner from Alabama and then find themselves in a position at 60 and say, eh, we really like this guy at 60. We don't think he's going to make it there. So we're going to move up to 45 and we're going to get our guy. And we're going to use one of our fourths this year and maybe a second next year. We're going to do something. We're going to move up. And the Bills end up with two starters. Whatever the Bills do, you guys are going to be down for. We're not going to be angry when it happens you're gonna sell yourself like i sell anything else like you sell anything else short of taking a quarterback you will be down if the bills decide friday morning you might call into gr and you know andy kaufman might be freaking out about it (laughs) and 
and, you know, on his wide receiver train. When they pick their wide receiver in the second round, except the fact that there is no golden ticket, there is no direct key, there is no exact science to what the Bills, what you are going to do, what mock draft is going to show, whether you know or don't know football, at the end of the day, the Bills are going to draft two players probably in the first and second round. And however they figure out, if they can find a way to get two starters out of that, whether it's a first-round wide receiver, a second-round safety, a first-round offensive lineman, and a second-round wide receiver, a first-round cornerback, and a second-round wide receiver, if they can find two starters in this draft, it will go a long way for this team to figure out how to be better. If they can find a way to have three starters in the first two days, then everyone will be super happy that they now have three positions that they've now settled exactly. instead of just two or just exactly. one. And if the Bills decide they want to trade up for Malik Neighbors at the number nine pick, at the number My eight man. pick, you will say, wow, they traded a lot, but holy cow, we've got this great receiver and now I'm super excited he's going to be better than Stephon Diggs. Oh my God, is Julio Jones trade all over again? Who fucking cares? And then you'll be like, I don't care that they traded a second and a first next year and a second next year and a fourth and a fifth and a seventh. Who cares? But at the end of the day, if they don't do that, you'll also be cool. You're all going to be cool regardless <laughs> of what happens. Stop Stop selling yourself any other scenario. You're all going to eat it. I'm going to sell it. You're going to buy it. You're going to sell it. I'm going to sell it. Drew's going to buy it. Chris is going to sell it. And Clay Travis is going to sit on it. <laughs> and I will toast. I will toast on that. You... I love Manic, Nate Geary. And I feel like the radio community doesn't get enough of Manic, Nate Geary. I love that we have this profound effect on people. We've made yeah, you Greg... You feed them liquor and you wait well, yeah. and then you see the results. We, we've <laughs> we've made Greg Thompson lose his shit. He's the first, his, his, own fam, his own flesh and blood have admitted that they've never heard him yell the way he snapped on me about like me just needling him over Creed Humphrey. They were like, what, what did you do to make him raise his voice like that? <laughs> we have a profound effect on people that we bring out something in them. It may not be good, but at least we're getting something, some juice. You are one of my favorite guests because when you go, you go. And that stream of consciousness right there. It was a stream of consciousness. And yet it was absolutely correct. Yeah. Wh where did we end up? Where did we end up? Can we get these out of the goddamn way? Yes. Well, yeah, Nate, I the enjoyed Nate, drinks yeah, the Nate Geary old fashioned. I used a uh, store pick Buffalo Trace Ooh. cinnamon syrup because you love that cinnamon syrup. What can I write to do? And black walnut bitters, and a, of course, Leftist Tears. Leftist Tears is what makes it so sweet. <laughs> so sweet. I, I, if you weren't all crippled up, I'd, I'd just ask you to fight him. Why don't I fight him? Look at him. He's so handsome. Is he though? Yeah. We're, we're we're in his we're in his studio that you know he comes in here and we can take it to the golf course. My thing you is you can teach you can teach me and Reed how to play golf. <laughs> yeah, Reed, Reed's yeah. not bad. Reed right. was Reed was at uh is he bad? Diamond Hawk. <clears throat> he was at Diamond Hawk the other day. Golf. I thought I thought he's okay for a guy who has the ability to play as often as he is. I would have expected him to be better. Oh, all right. Well. <laughs> Well, I mean, I've been waiting to... I like how we're slandering. Uh, he's been waiting for me to hold uh, for two years. And you know what? Maybe we get on the golf course, we, we, we'll, we'll get him in my domain. And <laughs> at the same time, I'll hold a snap on the golf course. I'll bring, a, I'll bring a ball. It'll be fun to figure this out. Here's what I want to know. First sure. of all, watching the wide receiver train derail, was anybody else as thrilled as I was? Like, in retrospect, I was mad. We were on a live stream Friday night, and I, I said to everyone at the table beforehand... I'm, I, I don't want to know your best case scenario because it's soft. Mm. What's the thing that's going to make you get up and walk out of this room? And <laughs> we went regime. around the room and I said, Keon Coleman. And then, it, <laughs> and then it happened. And everyone's like, Drew is the kiss of death. Me and Von Miller are apparently the kiss of death when it comes to like forecasting things happening or not happening. And then the best part is after I had just done a diatribe about all the reasons why I didn't like the Keon Coleman idea, we pick him, and I'm sitting here dumbfounded, and everyone's going, this has to be a good pick based on the fact that Drew is always wrong. He's always wrong. I'm wrong a lot, too. I don't even try to be sometimes. Sometimes I am 
just convinced in my rightness, and that is when I know that I am wrong. And what happened, though, for me, what I took joy out of was this idea that no matter where you sat on the wide receiver train, so if you were riding, like, first class, you were trade up, go get O'Dunes, we're going to make this, that was never even in the cards. We couldn't trade up to get BTJ. No. We couldn't trade up to 19. What the, who the hell thought we were trading up to nine? So that never happened. So those people just caught all the smoke. And then, like, they're the first ones to hit the ground when the train derails, right? Yeah. And then there's the people, like, in coach who are riding with the wide receiver double dip. Hey! And then there's the people sleeping in the boxcars in the back going, just take the fastest wide receiver available. Everybody got jammed up in this. Every single person caught a piece of detritus, and I love it. I absolutely love it. Now, how do you feel about the idea? Because we the, the the Coleman thing has been talked to death. The trade back with Kansas. The City? trade back. All the first of all, you so so you went at Jeremy a little bit about being the the, the conductor of the wide receiver train, Andy Kaufman. Mm-hmm. Your boy Joe. He's been getting ratioed pretty hard uh-huh. over this opinion that the trade back with Kansas City specifically was a bad idea. And he keeps trying to defend it, and he keeps digging the hole deeper and trying to defend it. If you had a moment to speak directly to him, what would you say? Dead air is not good. He's thinking. The man is I... he's a poignant man. I think that largely there is there has been zero room for smart takes on this. <laughs> okay. There just has been no it is so one way or the other. Well, there is no because it's too close in proximity. This is the problem with trying to make your opinion. Immediately after the thing happens, usually you have to let it breathe for a while sure. before you can come up with a salient point. These are guys who have to go on the radio every single day and make a show but about I, sports. I'm here to tell you that I don't, I don't think Joe is wrong. I don't think that he has necessarily framed it in a way that isn't super polarizing. But again, that is a little bit of the job this is, is it. to get people to talk about it. And he has gotten, and you know, we've all gotten people. That, here's, <laughs> here's my take Yep, is that I think that the people that are here talking about this as the end of the world, why would you pick up the phone and let the chiefs, if Brandon Bean and the bills really decided that, you know, Xavier worthy was not someone that they needed to take in that position, then that is their right. That does not mean that they are right right now. No. It doesn't mean they're wrong right now. In three years, you're going to look back and go, okay, Xavier Worthy turned into... You know, John I, Ross 2.0. I, I mean, I talked about I talked about in a show that we did with a guest who we had on before you were in studio. I talked about Xavier Worthy as one of the worst ideas, one of my least favorite ideas. In the it was probably my favorite idea. See, and the reason why I hated it was because I go light wide receivers in a league where physicality kind of sp- doesn't matter anymore. But spacing has allowed them to make plays. Nobody so, runs. No, I mean, there are just it is so few and far between where teams don't sure. draft physical corners anymore because physical corners can't keep up with the wide receivers that are around. Nobody runs man coverage. Everyone, everyone runs two deep shell mm-hmm. cover four, cover two. Uh, cover three, I mean, but mostly it's two deep shell, cover two and cover four and cover six and variations of everything in between. And for me, the thing that you like about a guy like Xavier Worthy is 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that's correct, is that's not a guy in the league that is going to succeed. And I'm not here to tell you that it's it's another Tyreek Hill. But what I am here to tell you is that the Chiefs own you. And this idea that, oh, Joe's scared of the Chiefs, and I, I'm glad my general manager's not scared of the Chiefs. 
Why wouldn't he? He should be fucking scared of the Chiefs. The Chiefs own you. Every time that it matters, they beat you. You should show a little bit of fear that you are letting a team, a superior general manager, a management group, a coaching staff that is better than yours because they've won three Super Bowls and you haven't gotten to one, they are a superior team than you. They want to call you, hang the fuck up, and force them to trade with somebody else. This idea that, well, they just would have got him anyways. I don't, you don't know that. Like, San Francisco might have wanted him. San Francisco drafted a receiver. You don't think they wanted to draft that guy? I bet you they would have drafted Xavier Worthy had the Bills not traded back mm. with the Kansas City Chiefs. You hang up the phone a hundred times out of a hundred with the Kansas City Chiefs. I don't care if you don't want to take Xavier Worthy. I liked him. I had a bias that I thought the Bills should take him at 28. I don't care that Kansas City got him. I, cared. I don't care. I care how they got him. You helped the Kansas City Chiefs get someone they wanted. I don't care if it was a center. I don't care if it was a fucking punter. Don't help that team get a player they want. And definitely don't do it if you're not getting insane. If you're not bending them over the barrel, then don't take the trade. They got okay value. They should have made them grossly overpay. And they didn't. So that's my problem. It's not who they picked. It's not that he's going to be the next Tyreek Hill. It's not that the Bills did this or did it. It is simply the fact that you should fear the Kansas City Chiefs. They beat you regularly when it matters. Their quarterback's better. Their coach is better. Their defensive coordinator's better. The way that they call plays is better. The way that their roster is put together is better. They have more blue chip athletes than you do. They are better. Don't even consider giving them an opportunity to get a player they want. And if you, this is what I do agree with, Joe. On if you really wanted Keon Coleman, you would not have Just taken. Take- you would not have moved back. You would have taken him at twenty-eight, and you would have feared that because of what you believe in him is that someone else in that spot would have then. But you know what it was? I just is they were good with Coleman. They were good with Leggett. They were good with Worthy, and they were good with Lad McConkey. They were good with any four of them. So why, if you were good with any four of them, would you help Kansas City get any of them? Is my question. And that's fair because we just Chris. Our show with Doug, we talked about the concept of you know the, the EJ Manuel trade back, where they go, no, we got our guy, but we traded back to get him. It's like, no, no, man, no. up and fucking take him. Then you wouldn't have. He's not your guy if you trade back. That's to get correct. Him. He's not your guy. He, that is correct. And you know what? Maybe the, because they they knew that they wanted the choice between him and Lad McConkey. Maybe I maybe I'll buy that at thirty three. That's why they didn't move back. Sure, sure. But this is way more about this i this weird sense of confidence that some of you Bills fans have about, well, let Kansas City sky more. Oh, uh, Kadarius Tony. Just because that they, you, you, you want to, you want to make a point. What the point that people are making is, is that no matter what the Bills did, and this was my point originally, is that no matter what they did, everyone was going to be cool with it. Yep. And that's what the case is, is everyone's cool with it. And listen, I like Keon Coleman. I think it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. I would have rather them taken him at eight at 28. And I know they got a third round pick and I like Dwayne Carter. I'm glad I like the class, but do not sit here talking out of both sides of your mouth that this was the guy they wanted. So they were good with the, with Kansas city coming up and Ricky Pearsall, man. I, I, I think that a lot of you have this demented syndrome of being able to just totally go into, I am going to sell, sell, sell whatever the bills do. And I I have to come off. Joe has to come off. Jeremy has to come off as people that are being curmudgeon and, and critical. And we say nothing good about the bills because you're trying to be objective. What I'm trying to do is just tell it the way that it is. And listen, Mm. am I sometimes overly critical? I don't think so, but if you view it that way, I'm not going to tell you that. But I also can – I feel like 
I am one of few people that do what I do that put themselves out there to talk about stuff that any time I could be wrong in a week, in a month, in a year. I was wrong about Josh Allen. You think I, I'm not hiding from that. I don't delete my fucking tweets. I don't do... I don't run from being wrong. It is really hard to be right and do what you do, what we do all the time. No one is. But the idea that I am some sort of, you know, oh, my God, you never have anything good to say. Why even be a fan? You're a Dolphins fan because the one funny tweet you wrote one time to a Dolphins guy, you, know, you want to be a Dolphins fan. It's like you I all mean, you, well, have you, a disease in your <clears throat> brain. You do have a mug. You do have a mug, which I have to get you one from Mark. Yeah. I got to get you one made. Remember, it's over. We still joke about that in our group chat. Sometimes, like every now and again, someone will be like, "We're talking about, we're talking I, about an obscure I don't run from thing," it. and someone will go, "Yeah, it's over with I a bunch did, of did, did, and we all know what he's read, talking didn't about." Didn't Reed just... quote tweet it <laughs> after after they won in Miami? I think he quote tweeted it. Yes, probably. Now, whatever. I don't. The dynamic don't is what it is, but you're you're not wrong. I I think that people get really caught up in this concept. I was confused by the decision to give them anything they like. If you like a player, you shouldn't be. And if they like a guy, I would have. I would. Why said, don't you like? Then, I would said, I would almost wonder. What do you think why, fair value is? My thing would be, why don't I like him? What do they see in him that I don't see? Because they're a team that has far bigger needs at wide receiver. Than I me. believe that they didn't know who they wanted. Fair. I believe that. I don't think that Brandon Bean and Brett. V- I don't think Brett Veach was like, yeah, here's who we're coming up for. That's not. That's not what happens on those calls. Right, true. he is true. Saying I want this pick, we look at it as value. It is numbers. It is this pick is worth X. You are trading me this pick, and I need X, Y, and Z so in order think, to so, equal this. So, do you think there's a, a, a world where they take worthy and Brandon being quietly like sitting there and go fuck? Absolutely, <laughs> fuck. Listen, I, I think the makeup of this team in the wide. This is, and, and I'm sure at some point we'll talk about the broader thing the broader picture not just this draft yeah, but of course this wide receiver room is terrible and the idea that people are talking about it being better than last year again I, I i i have i have co-workers that do this a lot which is like people on twitter it's like one guy tweets it and it's like you know, we turn this into a narrative because one well, guy tweets it. This is not newspapers do that. This so is not a defense. one person tweeted it and I am angry about it. This is lots of people share this opinion <clears> that <throat> they have some that that Stefan Diggs was fucking crippled or something like they didn't use him well or right. He didn't look right. It wasn't because he got old. In two weeks, it's because there was some sort of underlying injury. Uh, they switched offensive coordinators, and then they tried to throw him fucking screen passes. They tried to get him in motion and hand him the ball. They were doing anything they could to keep him involved in the offense. And it, this is, and then somebody tweeted at me. Okay, now I'm going to do what my coworkers do. Somebody tweeted at me the other day and said, Nate, don't you trust Josh Allen? Don't you trust Joe Brady? Yeah, I mean, this is the worst group of receivers, pass catchers, he's had since his rookie year. So I have no baseline to tell you whether or not I trust him with bad players that are catching the ball from him. Do I trust him? Sure. Do I trust Joe Brady? No, and neither should you. He, he's been a coordinator for like eight games, and they were... Mm, I don't know, not really eight games of prolific offense. They won games, sure. Does anybody want to get off to that Chargers game where they were playing a bunch of third stringers <laughs> in a team that was out of it in their second string quarterback? Do you guys want to get off on that performance? You're a bad guy if you bring that up. Now, what do you got here? Let me ask you this. Do you try? Yeah. Yeah. Do you trust Joe Brady? If you do, the wide receiver is good enough. That is the worst context. It's the worst argument I've ever heard because here's the thing is – People will say this. Here's what will happen. The Bills will win 10 games. Maybe they'll, maybe they'll win the division. Maybe they'll win a wild card. Whatever. And people will say, well, Mac Collins had 40 catches. He was actually good. No. Mac Collins got to play in a situation that he would play in nowhere else. 
had a quarterback that is better than 95% of the league and no one else to throw the football to. So yep. that's why he had 40 catches, not because he's a good receiver, but because he is a victim of the situation that he is in. And this is my point, is when, when this group... When Josh Allen throws for 30 touchdowns and 4,400 yards, people are going to say, the group is fine. And I'm going to tell you, you are insane. Because look at look at what the Tennessee – now the Tennessee Titans could do this because they have a rookie quarterback and a rookie contract. They are surrounding their quarterback with a very good – they just signed Tyler Boyd today. They've got, um, you know, they've got Hopkins. They have Calvin Ridley. They are putting a group of receivers and Tony Pollard. They're putting a group around him to say – we're going to know at the end of the year whether or not this guy can be our quarterback or we're going to move the fuck on. Last year when he beat the Miami Dolphins in Monday Night Football, he was throwing touchdown passes to Noah westbrook Akinney. Now he has a whole different slate of wide receivers to throw to. Last year, when the Houston Texans lost to the Ravens in the playoffs, look at the wide receiver core and the skill around him and look at what they have now. They have done work. The Bills have gone the opposite direction and they keep trying to table it as, no, oh, no, we've got a plan. And what it is is I wish it's the thing of like, my dad always had a phrase, don't piss on my leg and tell me it's raining. Mm. The concept is don't tell me you're not taking a step back and rebuilding. They are. We all know it. Just admit it. But they, they won't. have. They won't. They have, now, we have a bottom three group at the position of receiver. Well, we're going to talk about that in a few weeks. Maybe we bring it back for that podcast because I have a a whole exercise in mind. We, should talk we drafted draft. other players. But we have to <laughs> we have to move on. Now, here's some things. Some texts I received Friday night in the wake of the Coleman pick. I want to read them. Uh, Daddy, don't. Daddy, this hurts. Is OM, that what they were tweeting? Or OMFG, <laughs> what a mistake. Uh, did we actually just draft Nikhil Harry 2.0? Oh, here we go. Uh, touted is the best Touted as the best wide receiver class in years, possibly ever, and we go out of our way to ensure we landed the slowest of the bunch. And you just know that speed. idiot was clapping up a storm while it happened. <laughs> uh, can I let me let me let me pop in here? The dude even I don't followed, give a shit about his speed. But the dude even followed that up with a photo of one of those mechanic wind up monkeys with the symbols. And I was like, all right, now you're just being offensive. Here's one. I wrote this one down. Nurse. So apparently we're going to run our offense out of the AFC's only 13 personnel package. Awesome. Now, for those of you who don't understand, 13 personnel means one running back and three tight ends, which was supposed to be a shot at Coleman's speed. Now, as you said, you don't you don't care. But then of all the hyperbolic reactions out of this, I don't care about that. Like, I don't actually dislike that thought. You want to give me a formation that's Knox... Let me ask you a question. Kincaid. You know what DeMonte Adams' 40 time was? Don't care. Do you know what DeAndre Hopkins' 40 time was? Don't care. Do, do you know catch, what... Do wait, 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 wait. Do you know what Xavier Worthy's 40 time was? Not really, no. I just know he was touted as being 4.21? He fucking knows what it is. No, because I do, cause here's what I know. Most people who agonize over this shit end up getting themselves into this scenario that you're talking about. Xavier Worthy ran a 4-2-1, the fastest time in Combine history. Okay. And you know what happened? It hurt. The narrative on him, it hurt him that he ran that fast. It hurt him. You want to know why? Because everyone thought all he could do was run a straight line. Oh, he ran a four four or four two one, so he must and he's small, so all he does is run a nine route. He's not a he doesn't have I, I, I can't tell you how many times in tweets in responses he can't run the full route tree. Uh, he is too small. He is just a straight line speed guy. We, if you watched we have if you watched five from plays from Xavier stuff. Worthy, if you watch five plays, the guy can run a full he is a damn good route runner. And can I tell you this about Keon Coleman? Is that Keon Coleman ran a very similar time than DeAndre Hopkins, than Devontae Adams. And why 
if you are going to make a big deal and tell me if you're going to mock and knock a guy because he ran too fast and then also on the other side knock a guy because he ran too slow, you don't know shit about football. Bang. And to me, Keon Coleman was a very good to potentially great player had he been – and this is my big thing about football in general – is – the Bills drafted James Cook, and the general manager went on stage and said, well, you know, he's going to be a pass catching back, and he's not not big enough to uh, – uh, uh, what did he say? He said something on when they drafted him, and then he came back the next day or later that night and said – basically wanted to come back and say, by the way, James Cook, I said earlier, you know, he's kind of like a small, like he can't really – but I think he – like that's not – like he basically he had to go back on running what he back. said. He had to go back on what he said because he – and look at James Cook. Ran for 1,000 yards last year. It is not about what you do in college. It is about trying to find players that you think you can maximize more from. And I think in the case of Keon Coleman, he had a very inaccurate quarterback that yeah. threw the football all around. And people want to use – he played in above the rim, and he can go up and get the ball, but that's all he can do. And I really like Matt Harmon from Reception Perception. And – a lot of these really smart people that follow the position, that 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 project the position based on analytics, based on film, and based on prototypes, want to put Keon Coleman in the slot as a big slot and say that's the only thing that's going to make this guy successful in the NFL is if a team deploys him from the slot. And I disagree with that because you are using your analytics, you're using your eye test based on what he was asked to do in college with a quarterback – that and, and Jordan Travis is a fine quarterback and he probably would have won the Heisman had he not been hurt. But he wasn't particularly accurate. And to me, Keon Coleman is a player that can separate. This idea he can't separate, I think, is nonsense. If he couldn't separate, he wouldn't even be in the conversation for a first or second round pick. Guys that are at that position in the first or second round, they separate. And Keon Coleman ran the third fastest time through the gauntlet. He is a fast player that does not run in a straight line particularly fast. Xavier Worthy runs in a straight line really fast, but he also does other shit really fast as well. And there is room for all of us to have opinions about what straight line speed means, whether it's relevant or not. But just because one guy runs really fast in a straight line doesn't mean he can't do other shit. And just because a Keon Coleman doesn't run in a straight line really fast doesn't mean he can also be a vertical player down the field and create separation. These are these okay. are conflicting ideas. Now. You want to now talk about you, Bishop? Now, well, I would say, now that you've gotten this all off your Cooper chest. Cooper DeGene. The only thing I want to say, well, Dick, Cooper DeJean. Yeah, white safeties, Cooper same DeGene. thing. He's, he's white, it's DeGene. I just like the fact that someone, tweet, someone tweeted no. out on draft night, they were like, uh, the, of night two, they were like, oh, look, it's the, uh, so, so, or maybe it was day three, but it was the thing of, uh, <clears throat> they were like, here is the Eagles DB core this year. And it was a sign, and it just in the liquor store that just said exotic whites. And I was like, "That's hilarious! <laughs> That's hilarious! You drafted white DBs, and it's it's a thing now. Like now, it's a it's a thing. That's what we franchise. do now? I was mad at the draft, but I don't care. Like draft night, I was frustrated. And then you wake up and you take a look and you go, "Well, we lost. We got some size at wide receiver. We got some things going for ourselves." I do believe Bean, when he believes he plays faster than his 40 time, I think of Bolden. But in order to be in, to, in order to be Anquan Bolden, like former Bills great Anquan Bolden, <laughs> you have to, former Bills great, you have to, they first have training to, camp. They're going to have to coach him up. They're going to have to coach him up because he's going to have to play the game with an awful lot of toughness. If he's ever What's going, that even mean? It means you have to relish contact. It means you're going to have to become very comfortable with the idea that in, in the new NFL, where spacing and catching the ball in the open field and running for yards after the catch has become kind of the norm, you're probably going to be a wide receiver that finds a soft spot in zone, and then you get hit by two or three guys. If you're okay with that, 
And if you want to make truly explosive plays, you learn how to how to kind of lower your shoulder into that contact because sometimes those guys, like we've seen it, bad safety play, where you have safeties who who would rather hit with a shoulder than wrap tackle. You can bounce off that and just keep going. Do you know For what him, the highest? Do you know what team had the highest percentage of man coverage was last year? Who? Before I ask you who, what do you think that number was? The highest, highest percentage, percentage of man coverage. I'd say probably about 31%. Okay, it's, it's much higher than that. It's really? double that. Okay. But what do you think the league average was? Is it league? Most of the league. Under 50%. Yeah, I would say they it's 47. Under so it's, under, it's under 50%. Okay. So why does he have to play? And let me ask you this. What about a player like him makes you think that contact is some sort of like the idea that oh he can't separate with speed, okay, but he I mean he has he separates, but he's a large human. The idea is you can't do the Lashawn McCoy thing when you don't have, when you don't have Xavier Worthy speed. The yeah. only difference is you're not going to be the Lashawn McCoy who I thought we were runs, talking about receiver. No, no, no. Who run, before we move on? Oh, who runs oh, okay. away you, from contact? <laughs> Remember that one time? Remember the one time Drew Drew didn't do the intro to the show? You're yes. never gonna run <laughs> do away. Do you remember from that cop? bullshit? And now yeah. he's trying to fuck it. What is this? His show? Yeah, he's just trying to. <laughs> it's almost like it's mine, right? You're never well, gonna be the all, guy who runs it's away. Chris's from show. Cop. It's it's Clay Travis's show, by the way. Yeah, yeah. We'll get to him. Clay oh Travis. no, he's got a whole. Oh no, trust me. <laughs> so you got you got the Clay quote of the week. So does he talk. Does he call somebody a cuck? Does he talk about the UCLA protests? What does he got? <laughs> so. So, <laughs> you can't, like, if you think about it, you he's not going to run away from a lot of hard contact. So, it's just that you have to learn to love that. You have, you have to make that what you... Got, like, a little residual sip of just the cinnamon. You have Delicious. to love what oh. that is, right? That's what happens when you're a slower, bigger wide receiver, but not even necessarily slower, just... You know that contact is going to come, so you need to enjoy that. Anquan Bolden was a wide receiver who I think most kind of embodies what that is. If he, a fellow Florida Florida State alumni, if he can ever mirror his game after that, even just minorly, I mean, he's a much more athletic version of what Bolden was. He could be an impact player. I think a lot of people are selling him short. Now Anquan we... Bolden ran a four seven one. Yes, I know that. Because I thought you said research. you didn't know about forty times because you didn't care. No, no, I oh, I, I researched oh, that. Oh, that one. Because okay. I was just looking for comps. I go, who are the slowest players to ever be productive in the NFL? Quinton uh, Quintez Cephas. Quintez Cephas sucked. He, he was, was like slow. a four seven six. <laughs> That's why when we signed him, people. Do you like, know what I ran? You know what my forty time is? I bet you your forty time is embarrassing. Six minutes. Not now. I'm talking about when six I played minutes. when I was in college. <laughs> six minutes. Did you know my forty time was in college? What was it? Four eight nine. I would probably say like a four nine. Yeah, I like that look on your face. Four nine. I ran a four seven six in college. And then Buff State called. No, <laughs> I was in college when I ran. <laughs> Wait, so Buff? I was a running quarterback. Well, yeah, because you played for Buff State. The line sucked. If you didn't fuck run, off, the line sucked. If you didn't boys. run, you die. You guys were great offensive lines. <laughs> Probably the best offensive line I've ever played for was in college. Sorry. What are, you guys had Mike Kelly on. He was a tight end. He couldn't block for shit. He also couldn't catch. But I love him. Oh, I can't wait to take this. He back to work. Mike Mike will. Be, I'm sure he was probably when you guys were on his podcast. And what did he tell you? Fucking drop the ball all the time. Him and Dave, my two tight ends. You know what they would do? Fucking drop the ball <laughs> all the time. It wasn't just him; it was my other receivers. So, so all they did was drop the ball. So I throw a great ball. Yeah. These dudes dropped it. I'm all not gonna the lie time. to you. I got a quarterback like you hurt one time, kid Mike Mead. I was playing left guard. Quarter, coach's son. Coach's that's why, son playing that's why quarterback. Drew, that's why Drew doesn't care about forty times. And, know why. and one day, <laughs> offensive line. One day we're <laughs> in here. Fuck. We're in the fucking huddle. And Mike Mead is reading us the riot act about how we're not giving him enough time to throw accurate balls. And we're all sitting here going, this dude couldn't. He's not accurate no matter how much time you give him. Drew, what we number could... were you? In the 70s? 
I think it was 75. Yeah, I knew. First of all, I knew you were in the 70s. Second of all, you wore the big the big mask with the fucking no. bar in the middle. Shh. Nope. You wore the bar in the middle. He goes, and Shh. and you had knee braces and, nope. and then you uh, Nope. Don't tell me I'm wrong. Nope. I know I'm right. He had the Brian Cox. Yeah, uh uh-huh, yeah, the neck dude, roll. Dude, if I could have Dude, I wish I could have earned a neck roll. I wish I could have played to earn a neck roll. Now I could use a neck roll right now. My neck's killing me. <laughs> now here's sort of, yeah, because we're old as shit. Well, we here's got a new thing. fancy chair, so here, here, it, yeah, it's got lumbar support. Here, here's the fun thing: there was a game. He's reading us the right act in the huddle, and you just go, "All right, well, fine, fuck you. I've had enough. I've had enough of your shit." So we go to the line, and I'm, we line up, and I just look at the kid across from me, and I spit on the mouth guard, and I go, I'm "Blocking left," and he goes, "What?" And I go, I'm blocking left, and then the ball gets snapped, and I fire off the ball into space, and there's just a window. And he, now here I am thinking like he'll get harassed, and he'll understand what it is. No, 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 he got crushed. That guy murdered him. I didn't know he was going to hold the ball for that long. Separated his collarbone. He was <laughs> done for the year. And then the best part is, Tim Neary came in. Tim Neary could throw the football, but also run. And because we were a bad football team, he ran a lot. And he saved our asses, and we actually won our first game that season with Tim Neary under center. And so, in a way, I almost helped the team, but it was also like, man, eh, fuck you. Yes, I understand. Now, moving on from Keon Coleman, because I think that that's been beaten to death. Yeah, we just spent 40 minutes on it. I know. The rest of the draft wasn't... All right, Clay, relax. The rest of the draft, <laughs> not bad. Defensive back Cole Bishop and Daquan Hardy from, uh, what was it, Penn State? Mm-hmm. These guys. Now, about Bishop, there's something in Dane Brugler's review of him that's stuck in my head. And it's this idea that as he's watching... Talk about the beast? Well, as he's watching him in film, he goes, he would rotate single high to the box, then roll up to cornerback or nickelbacker, in about five nickel, other positions nickel, in between. Nickelbacker? This is you his, to say that? This, this is, is how you remind me <laughs> what I really am. <laughs> every every white guy knows that song. This is how. <laughs> right, is, this, is this where we're going to break out the karaoke fight? Yeah. Man? So the idea is he's already naturally doing. He seems like a fit, if only because he's already doing things that McDermott asks his safeties to do. No matter how, like, like who else was on the clock there, right? Like, when we were going down the safety rankings and you're like, oh, here's the sweet spot. We had that whole podcast with Bruce where we talked about the second round being kind of the sweet spot for safeties. Buda Baker and all of these other guys. When you look at what was handed to us, I think what Bullard went a few picks before. I believe Javon Bullard got taken just like he did, yeah. 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 So he I liked I like the kid from Texas Tech too. Sure. Dorian something around. But he didn't go until the fourth round, which yeah. tells you that yeah. GMs were actually yeah. a lot lower on him than most Twitter pundits. Now, the idea that you have this guy, right? Like the thing that disappeared from Poyer's game over the last two years was just the explosive plays. You didn't really see him get. He was slow and old. Exactly, because that's what age. That's I'll what say this. Thirty-three. I'll is. Say this about Poyer. He was slow and old and not good at football. But that that dude can golf. He's an athlete. Now, my thing is, he also when, loves Clay Travis. When you mm-hmm. when you watch him, right? <laughs> you and you know, like what he used to be in his prime. Yeah, he used to be able to do all the things they talk about Cole Bishop being able to do. So it shouldn't shock anybody that he was their second round pick. What did they say about you and your prime? Me and my prime? I'm still in it, brother. Yeah, the fuck you are. <laughs> I'm no, no, no joke. We went over. We were. Chris. I am Before, the best. The, Nate, Chris. I am the best version of me that has ever existed Chris. right now, sitting in this chair. No. Before we, I you came over. Me. We were live on y'all tube, and we were talking about my hockey y'all tube. Yeah, YouTube. Is that YouTube for right wingers? Yes, it is. Y'all tube. Or from we the dis- south. we discussed uh, my hockey career because I'm in a, a 30 and over draft league, and Drew wanted to know what pick I would be, which I put I put myself as a second round pick. 
out of 14 teams. I'd be in the top, Medical red flag, top 28, when he, when yes. He scored, like, he's going over his box scores, and he goes, yeah, and in this game I scored eight goals and had three assists. Like, why aren't you a first? You he know, on my back. Listen, Drew, you look at him. He's got medical. He's got medical red flags. But when you yeah. look at him, athlete is not the first word that comes to mind. No. No. <laughs> I love it. But so with that said, Cole Bishop, great pick. Yeah, I, I like, like it Cole because Bishop. he's going to be a st- – Because it replaces – it. because Mike Edwards never really did it for me. This hey, hey, I like Mike Edwards. Hey, but. is he off the bus starter? I think if you put him and Mike Edwards <laughs> next to each other in camp and you make them compete for a strong safety spot, it's hard. Are you guys going to cut this? Can I, can, I, can I say something off the record? Are you guys going <laughs> to – No, you can – no, it's going to stay in. Uh, I'm out then. He goes, I'm out. Yeah. I'm out. I like the guy who understands what McDermott schematically He likes the white safety. <laughs> we all do. Daquan, <laughs> da, Daquan Hart. Damn it, Craig. Thank God for these swiveling chairs. <laughs> Daquan Hardy. That sounds like a solid value pick if you're looking He's for like a returner. What, seventh round pick? Yeah. You're looking for a returner? Okay. Yeah. He's got to make the team, though. I mean, he's got to make the team as a corner. And he might have competition because I saw this tweet earlier today, and I was like, this is genius. So Tony Mastrangelo, I want to give him credit. Who? Yeah, exactly. Shut your mouth. Tony Mastrangelo. Yeah. Who, who is that? Though, right? Nobody. It's oh. nobody important. Just a guy whose daughter got real sick one time, and I started following him. And, like, he and I were talking, and it was fine. Okay. He tweeted at Chopin the Bulldog today. It was like, I was listening to you guys talk about Justin Fields returning kicks today, and it made me think. What Josh if, Allen. What if the Buffalo Bills had our new former rugby player return punts and kicks? The 300-pound kid? Yeah. Yeah. Clayton Travis. Clayton Travis. Love to see it. Clayton Travis. <laughs> he, you know the only reason he likes it. Because he wants to get that jersey. He wants to get that Bills jersey with the last name Travis on. It's too bad he can't be number sixty-nine. <laughs> yeah, that'd Maybe be a good number. Yeah, well, he's got to make the team first. I mean, the thing is, being admitted, he might not have picked Hardy at all if it wasn't for the the new kick return rules. Now you have to try to invest in that. Well, he did. Now could have got you... a guy in the first round. <laughs> What do you think about Ryan Davis? Ray Davis. Ray Davis, Ryan Davis, doesn't fucking matter. I, like, R. Davis. I, felt, I felt dumb for a second. I was yeah. like, well, who the fuck is Ryan Davis? It wouldn't be a Bills draft if we didn't reach for a running back. I don't think it was a reach. Okay, so Braylon Allen, Isaac Rorendo, they're both on the board, and you decide, well, I'll take this guy. Braylon Allen had a lot of fumble issues in college, and yeah. the other guy Sell runs it to fast. Me. Sell it to me. Ray Davis, if he wasn't 24, would have been probably more highly touted. He was an older running back, but he had he's the only player in SEC history to run for 1,000 yards for two separate SEC teams. He is both a viable pass catcher, a willing blocker, and someone that this team desperately needs in terms of a, a true downhill north-south but can break run runner. I would have preferred Audric Estime myself. Yeah, no bias shit. aside, Notre yeah, Dame bias. Um, Notre Dame bias. He's also twenty years old, so. But Fair. you, I think the Bills are a team that, even though everybody every year will mock a Bills first round pick as a running back or have them tied to any running back that is good, that is a potential free agent, that the Bills will be mocked or be talked about as being a team in for them. They do not invest in the running back position other than draft picks. They do not give them and second you contracts. Shouldn't. Correct. So even if they use a second round pick on a running back or a third round pick or a fourth round pick on a running back, they're here for four years and then they're gone. So is he a very good compliment to James Cook? He absolutely is a very good compliment to James Cook. I really like the three pieces they have in the running back room now and Ray Davis, who can block on third down, but be a guy that can block, and if he has to come out of the backfield and catch the football, he's very competent in doing that. His story is great. The Bills decided that they were going to draft a bunch of guys that are, I, in my opinion, 
high character leader type players. And they lost a captain and weight room every year won the fucking weight room contest. The guy that works out the hardest award and Gabe Davis was a captain. They lost Stefan Diggs, who was a captain. They lost Jordan Poyer, who was a captain. They lost Micah Hyde, who was a captain. They lost Tremaine Edmonds a year ago, who was a captain. And they lost Tredavious White, who was a captain. I just still got read six captains that the Bills have lost in the last two years. They are looking for young players with leadership ability that even if they may not seem conventional or may not seem a high level or high end athlete, they didn't run the fastest 40 time or Dwayne Carter to me is another player that sticks out to me as a leadership type guy. And Cole Bishop captain Utah seems like a leadership type guy. And you talk about the Van Prong Cedric Van, Cedric Prong, Van Prong, Granger, Prong Granger, Granger uh, who is a two-year captain, three-year starter, started 44 consecutive games, all SEC last year, second team All-American, second team All-SEC the year before, and was a guy that, to me, is another really good pick for the Bills. And I think people are being a little dramatic. I don't think he's going to start this year. No. Maybe I'll be wrong. But that's a guy that could start games in the future. And so, Davis, just to kind of cap this off, gave, Davis has a – he kind of cut his teeth in the right division. And also he has a pedigree that seems to speak to future success. You look at the Van Prong Granger. Van Prong Granger. Like, that's so hard to say. Can we just call him VPG? Well, C C V P G C V P G. I, I I don't know how to condense VPG. this. I don't know how to condense his name properly, but that's too many. It's too many words for a jersey. No one's gonna buy that. I don't know. He's one of my favorite picks of the entire draft. He was a guy I wanted. I thought we would have to take him in the second or third. I'm really happy we didn't. But that's why you don't know draft shit. Of course. So when you get him and you realize, like, hey, what's the, hey, Nate, has the Georgia rushing attack, here's a question, has it been good? Has the Georgia rushing attack been Very. good? Okay. Guess who's been the linchpin of that offensive line for the last couple of years? Cedric v- C- VPG. VPG. There we go. So, if you want to take that guy on a fifth round flyer, awesome. I saw a. I'm not um, argue with that. I saw that's value. That's incredible value for all these people screaming after the after the Coleman pick. For all the people screaming about how Bean doesn't understand value, he doesn't. Because I'll tell you what, Bishop, Davis, VPG, those are screaming value picks. I saw a John Ledger tweet about this, about VPG, talking about how the draft process, the combine, he had a tough, but you turn on the game film, he's a player. He has short arms. He got, he got, he got bone for short arms. I'm with two T-Rexes here myself. So between you and between you and Chris, T-Rexes? Are you kidding me? I have an ape index bigger than Sonny Liston and Michael Phelps. All right, well, I got I got <laughs> I got alligator arms. Freaking producer over here. So, what, yeah, that, those are normal arms, Drew. No, We're stand up back to back, dude. I got you on. We'll I got this. You know, you do it right now. I got you on. I got you on two cam. Do it, Drew. Drew and Nate are going to stand next to each other. No, turn around. Okay. Face the camera. God, face the camera. Okay. Now, oh. no, Nate. Just go shoulder to shoulder. There you go. It's a normal fucking human. You are no. a mere man. You're taller. <laughs> All I'm, right. I'm a lot of things. Now continue you. this in front of the mics. Come on. There we go. I got, I got Shaquille O'Neal like length on my arms. He's just a normal man. See, when I do it, my tips of my fingers go just past his wrists. <laughs> Well, that's what I said. He actually is. He's an alligator arm, yeah. He actually does have alligator He's like, oh, Nate, what did you want me to search on the computer? (laughs) (laughs) Left his tears. (laughs) He's trying to watch Clay Travis. He keeps looking up Ray Travis. He's like, no, I don't want country music. I don't want country music. Stop doing this. I can't reach the sea. So. Take another, uh. Yeah. No, no, no. Give him, uh, give him the specialty. No, I'm not. Yeah, no, no. Give him the specialty because he likes it. You like this? Oh, that's a new one. 
Oh yeah, the mango peach. It fucks. <laughs> now here's a question: Can you can you pronounce the name of the linebacker that we drafted? No. I'm gonna now. Now here's the thing: I'm gonna bet you a Seagrams. Oh, I forgot. I, I have. Do I? I feel like I owe you guys some Seagrams. Yeah, a lot. <laughs> I have one here on the table. Here's what's gonna happen. We're both gonna can take. I read the name. I need it in front of me. No, no. Here, I'll put it up a here. here okay, here's cool, the best yeah. part. I'm going to go. put it up. Now, here's the funniest part about this is that I heard it earlier, and I don't, I still don't remember it. I have it <laughs> correct. I have it correctly on the soundboard. Now, if you can pronounce this Washington linebacker's name properly. Better than you. Better than me. I will drink a Seagram's. Let's give it a whirl. Are you going first? You go. Give it your best stab. A Defwan Olafascio. True. That sounds right. True. What? <coughs> give us. Give us a rip. <coughs> Focus. I want to say Edifwan Olafascio. Edifwan Olafascio. You were both wrong. Fuck. Right, By a mile. We should both I'll get out here. I'll go get a Seagram's out Son of the of fridge. A bitch. <laughs> well, I didn't feel like I was that. Adafuan Alafoshio. Edafuan. Ulofoshio. Like, guys, this is one of those things like a like I feel like one of those kids who loses the script, uh the the, the what flavor is this one? That's blueberry acai. No, not for me. It's he he knew. Did you make me happy? He knew that go. I was about to be happy. He brought you. He brought you the the OG. Yeah. No, so why you guys? No. 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 Hey, no. Hey, no. You just, God. You don't. Hey. D- don't do that. You don't have Drew's teeth. <laughs> no. 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 You got. I actually you, spent money on my. Dad. Yeah. You yeah. spent what money. What you just need is an adult. Was exactly. That a, was that a twist off? Yeah, yeah, there was a twist off. All right, here's what. <laughs> that's hey. on camera. Oh, I love that. No. That's on camera. <laughs> it was. That was. Unfortunately, that was not on camera. The camera's on me because you two dickheads are gonna chug that, and then we're gonna listen. Uh. We're gonna listen to EJ Snyder, who we had on our linebacker show, talking about Uofosio. The guy that I want to highlight to you is a guy from right up the road. I was just at his pro day. So chug a those. Narrow cone. And the narrow cone is pass coverage, specifically pass coverage in zone. And he was literally one of the best pass coverage linebackers in zone in the entire country. And he's still going to be picked down at like 240, 250 because, oh, yeah, there's other things in this game that are holes, but that's not one of them. And it's Edifuan Ulufosio out of Washington. If you want a coverage linebacker that you can steal late in the draft, Ulufosio is a guy you want. He moves extremely well. Eyes are in the right place. So all the things you said about McDermott's defense, like he did those for the Washington defense. He made plays that way. He is not a guy that's going to come up for the most part and fill gaps. He can chase to the edges. He does have some speed, but man, it is all about smart positioning and just, I'm just going to call it feel savvy in zone pass coverage for Lufosio. And if you need that, you're going to be available. You're not going to have to spend a high pick on it. There you go. EJ Snyder, bootleg football, came on our show to talk about linebackers. And he actually went to Ufosio's Pro Day. Loved him. Bill signed Deion Jones. You guys know that? Yeah, I yeah. saw that. We made fun of it earlier. Oh, okay. Well, I, didn't, so, I wasn't here for that. I was... So, guys, we both just chugged to Seagram's, and that takes me back to my el- my younger days, right? Like, where we were trying to get Which diabetes. Which was a long... Yeah. Dude, we've been doing this for nine years. Yeah, nine do you know that? Years. June is... Long time ago. June, we're going to start uh, year nine. Uh, last year was my 10th year at WGR. I know, because I remember meeting you. Now, maybe you don't know this. I met you. The first time I met you personally was at the 2017 Bills training camp. Chris and I came. We were talking to you. And I will never forget a moment where you, like, saw John Murphy and was like, Hey, John. And he looked at you and gave you the fan treatment. And you were like, I've been doing this guy's fucking show prep for years. And you snapped. And I go, that's the radio industry, baby. 
Yeah, what was the bar that we went to? Uh, the uh, oh! Pittsburgh Pub. Pittsburgh Pub, yeah. That That's the year? That's the year, Lacel? baby. Yeah, Lacel and uh, James. Icy Vic. Icy yep. Vic and all the guys. Yeah, you Nate, you and I exchanged radio stories because I had told that's you. right. You I had right worked in, a, in Atlanta for 680 The Fan and 790 The Zone, and we discussed radio stories, and I was a producer for Clay Travis's show. Not really, hey, but I was. He, I he, he, dude, do you know? I was surprised. I was surprised that, that wanking. No, I, saw it. It I was real. surprised that I swear it was real. You had similar radio stories for the Buffalo market. Oh, yeah. that I had for the I Atlanta know, sorry, market. I shared for and you. my mind, my mind was blown because I was like, I'm so glad I don't. I didn't pursue that even further because I I, re- I handle... remember what story I shared with you. Yeah, you did. Yep. I shared a very particular story with you. Yes. Chris. And so it's this concept of radio is radio is radio. Cut and now throat. We, and now we do a podcast. Yeah. But it was that day... Of I got to get in the podcasting game. I got to get a radio. Yeah, but... Howard, when he retired, you know what his, you know, you know what, you know what, you know what his advice with me was? Hmm. So, so, so this is the question. <laughs> Can you do a podcast? No. Do you have the commitment? Do you no. have the force? I do. I don't have. I don't have. I don't have a Chris. Do you, I don't yeah, got. I don't got a need, big <laughs> idiot alligator arms <laughs> loser. I don't have. That. You have to no. find yourself a Chris. If I, if I had a Chris, I'd look have, at all I'd this. Have, this is all because of I'd him. have a podcast <laughs> if I had a Chris. Exactly. Most people would. Chris is the best, and for as much shit as I give him. He is. He's got the, three screens. I can't tell if his pants are on or off back there. <laughs> <laughs> I, got, Re- I got jeans on. Yeah, he's got denim. And I know I know what happens inside denim, brother. I was in high school once. Uh, I'll tell you this. Guys, this Rocket, draft, rocket. So as we wrap this up. Oh, this that's draft, right. We were talking about the draft. Yeah. yeah well, look, it's funny how we all get derailed. And we we're just, talking about Solomon. He's my favorite. Well, my really, favorite it's the Seagrams. Like that, pick. That's the kid derail- from Troy is my favorite pick. It's derailed the whole Why? Time. That's your favorite pick? Yeah. Why? I think he's got he's got juice. I like this. So who do you think he's competing with in camp? The kid, uh, Two Hill. Two Hill. Yeah. The, okay. The, the, the dude they got from Washington. Yeah. So that's the direct competition. All right. I think so. Yeah. I mean, there was people who came out post draft and said, "Look, the Bills got a steal in that pick." I think that the fifty three man roster will have defense ten defensive linemen like it did last year. Yeah. And. They've got four veterans at defensive tackle and one young guy. They've got four veterans at defensive end and one young guy. And I think early on, the young guy, Solomon, I think one of the veterans. Well, Kingsley Jonathan probably has something to say about that. Nate, you want to say that again? (laughs) Yeah. Hang on. He's putting on the board. He's already got the C group's bed board out. What the fuck is my Baker MVP? What's that? Oh yeah, no, Nate, you've had a lot of losers over there. Yeah, here, I'm a, for Guys. for anybody watching on YouTube. <laughs> here is a, a bunch of Seagram's bets. <laughs> this one's kind of weird from last year. David Johnson what on is, the. What is Baker MVP? Uh, you said he was going to be MVP uh, said, second year. He's said, first or second you in, called in him voting. Being the first or second yeah. in voting for MVP. I think I was misquoted. No, I don't think you were. It's on the record, dude. It's on the record. Chris goes back. I'd, I'd like you to find that. Oh, dude, he'll waterboard you with the audio, and then you'll have to. You'll just have to soak in your. Do water. I write it? Final fifty. Nate, final fifty-three. That Solomon makes the final fifty-three. No, you said ten. Ten defensive linemen. Yeah, ten. Yeah. Ten linemen. Edge and edge yep. in the line. Yep. And then, do you want to make Solomon one of them? And I will, I will, no. But I will say, <laughs> yes, no. 10 defensive linemen make the 53, six pack. Six. Ooh. Seagrams. Yeah, but that's. And I'll get a ride here. I'll get a ride here. <laughs> do you know anyone willing to drive you anywhere? I don't think you do. Wait, is that you'll get a ride to the hospital <laughs> to solve diabetes? <laughs> put, put me down for six. And it's an all or all. How about this? It's an all for nothing. I'll take the six. And how many do I owe for Baker? Five. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You still owe an incredible amount. Like it's all. What else do I owe? I saw my name on there twice. What else do I owe? Uh, let me. Uh, What's his tab at? 
bartender. Well, your tab's at like seven. <laughs> well, one, I don't think we, uh, I don't think that there was a stat, like a statistical outline to follow. But uh, I do have to cross this one out that Jake Fromm threw an NFL touchdown pass. I think I drank for that though. Yeah, I, I, I think. I, but I then you that. also have uh, James Cook more snaps by week fifteen. Two flavored Seagrams in a beer bong, which I don't have that beer bong anymore. I appreciate sure that. That came from one of our there, listeners. Wait, you got rid of the beer bong? No, uh, Benton broke it. Oh. But he, I'm pretty sure that I won that bet, no? I don't know what the. It was, he was out, he was going to out snap Singletary by week, whatever I said. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that happened. That might have happened. Yeah, we haven't followed this. Drew, you have a OBJ signs by week 17. Of last year? Yeah. All right, well, yeah. why don't you drink that one right now? It's, we're out. Chris? We're out. Oh, we're out. We already ran yeah. out. And then Guys, eat. we're going to have a Seagram's catch-up show with us and Nate and Chris. And we're, we're, we're just going to drink as many Seagram's as we can. We're all going to go to the hospital. Camera. In fact, we'll just get a bunch of insulin and we'll nah, just take and then, it out. And then we'll, could you clip the guy that says <clears throat> diabetes? Yeah. Now, the guy now, with, the, with the anteater mustache? Now, we, we kind of breezed over Dwayne Carter. I like him a lot. It's, he might be my favorite. It pick might of the draft. be the most solid. You just pick said of the draft. that about Solomon. No, Shut no, no. Up. <laughs> Carter. But rules. What, what, what do you care about facts? The Clay idea, Travis cares Clay. about facts. <laughs> the idea that you drafted, we love facts on the right. <laughs> the idea that you drafted a rotational defensive tackle yeah. to throw into the mix, who has the upside of hey, we don't have to go back to a. 90-year-old Jordan Phillips? He already signed to somebody else. Anyways. Doesn't matter. God. Jordan Phillips was old when he played for last year. Chris, really quick. What do you think the likelihood is that Chris or that, that Drew and his teeth could get through this ice cube? <laughs> I've been thinking about it all show. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at this fucking ice cube, and I'm like, I wonder, could, could, could fucking Drew get through this ice cube? Guys, we can do it Maybe. as an after dark. Here's what I know. Final <laughs> thoughts about the draft class. It's actually um, one of the things where I look and you see, like you said, experience. They drafted guys who had a lot of leadership qualities and experience. They did this thing where it's like, oh, hey, we stocked a bunch. Now we go into 2025 with, what, 13 draft picks? A lot. Because of all the trade backs this year? With two fourths. Yeah, we did set seconds. up ourselves pretty good for next year. So the idea is if you were ever going to try to, like, hey, we need to start building the foundation of something new. These are all the moves of a franchise that... A franchise. A flanch. A, f- a flanch. Listen, don't make me call you Nabe Geary. <laughs> These are all the moves of a franchise that understand that they have to start rebuilding. They just don't want to call it that. They don't want to refer to it as a rebuild. And so in that way, what they're doing is they said, Hey, listen, we can do all these wild things for receivers. And then they don't. <laughs> They get a blocking receiver and a guy who should work from the slot. And they go out and they get a set, a future center and uh, maybe starting three tech. Sure. And then they go, hey, <laughs> we, we could do all these things. We we draft all these players, a maybe starting safety. Because this <laughs> is the year we turn it over. It's not going to be 2018 because Josh isn't 2018 Josh. Josh is 2024, 20, 25, Josh, <laughs> which unfortunately means he knows how to throw the football. He just needs guys who can catch it, mm. which we didn't give him any of. <laughs> At least not as of today. So you're going to run an offense through the running game. You're going to run an offense through tight ends. Mm. You're going to. Throw Sounds like a good idea. Sounds the, like something that happened back in 1970. Yep. The One of the things I hate is these people who go, oh, well, Keon Coleman wins 50-50 balls. I go, do you know that the in the NFL, the margin between a 50-50 ball, like, Nate, you used to play quarterback. Sure did. It was di- really good. Just the, ask anyone. The difference between a 50-50 ball and a 70-30 ball is really not that. It's all about the spiral. It's, it's really not that different. About the accuracy. It's it's like, oh, can this go one way or the other way? Well, I'm just going to huck it up. Well, that's a terrible idea. I'll tell you what. I think this draft class laid the groundwork for what will be next year's draft class. And I think that this year, and it's funny because you're uh, also, 
another one of your coworkers today on the drive here. I hear Bulldog on the radio. He Stud. said something, and I quoted it because I wanted to get it right. He goes, "Last year, you know, he goes with this wide receiver position, like you said, where you think we're bottom three. He goes, well, last year we sailed to the playoffs. We might struggle this year. You think we sailed to the playoffs last year?" Yeah. You think this team didn't have to take a long look in the mirror and try to figure out what the fuck it wanted to be? It's over. And re- it's over. And reinvent itself over the course of It's over. And reinvent itself. By the way. And figure out how. You're welcome, everyone, for putting the, rever- the reverse curse on. Uh, like, <laughs> you're fucking welcome. This and, is what I do. I. I and, I take one for the team all the time, and no one says thank you. I'm getting you one of those mugs. I'm no one gonna, says thank you. I'm going to drink coffee out of one. By the way, this drink- fucking linebacker's from Anchorage, Alaska? Yeah. And he was born in 2000. Yep. All right. <laughs> what, you think people aren't having babies 2000. in Alaska? Thousand. And he's playing football. What kind well, of football is going on in Alaska? Well, he moved to Las Vegas following his freshman year of high school. But even then, what kind of high school? They went is? from Alaska to Vegas. That is a story if I have ever heard it in my uh, Alaska to Vegas. He might raise is a lot like Buffalo to Paris. At the end of the day, this class not sexy. Not going to blow the doors off anybody, but you're laying the foundation for what's going to be the next thing. And I think people need to wake up to that. To wake up, sheeple! You know, Clay Travis would be on here going, the, what the liberal media doesn't want you to know. <laughs> and it would just be that thing. The Bills actually have a rebuilding year in front of them, and they're not admitting to it. We should grill them in open court. What's that fucking idiot's name that's uh, on with Clay Travis? Fuck Sexton. No, the one that used to be on ESPN. I have no idea, because he does Big, it. dumb, fat fucker. What's his name? I don't know. He's on. Does a radio uh, show with Buck Sexton, and no, he's, he's on. He's on. He used to be on the Burn. Before that, he did it by himself. The big fat fucker. Who is it? Who knows? You, you have a thing against fat guys? Hold on. No, no. If I, you're gonna look I, it up, go I, ahead I really because all I know he is, did a solo show on Fox Sports Radio. All I know is, guys, fat we've been. What were we now, Chris? An hour and a half. That hour was, and thirteen uh, minutes by ESPN. my clock. Okay. Here's what I know. How. Funny is that that I Google searched big fat fucker that was on ESPN and Jason Whitlock is the <laughs> first name Whitlock. that pops up. Oh yeah, no, he didn't do a show with him. No, he that's he never that, did a show with me, him. That's that, that's not hilarious. <laughs> yeah, that is hilarious. Big fat fucker that used to be on ESPN, and the first thing is, are are you talking about Jason Whitlock? Question <laughs> mark. Who is the big fat guy on that used to be on ESPN? Drop down. Jason Whitlock. That <laughs> dude sucks. What I'll say is the Bills used this draft against our wishes as a fan base where we thought, like, hey, you can just keep keep, in the, wi- keep the window open. They were like, nah, instead we're just going to dive into this thing of we're going to build the foundation of something that can win in a year or two. And that I sucks. And that sucks because they've spent all this time telling us they're not doing that. No, uh, Brandon Bean said they're in transition. Now he said it. No, he said it. What do you mean now he said it? Of course, that's what I'm talking about. That's what he did. Of course. Now that it's over, but otherwise, whenever they were like, hey, is this a rebuilding year? And they'd be like, well, I wouldn't say that. Well, rebuilding and transition, those are different, aren't they? (laughs) (laughs) Like That's only for you and Clay Travis to do Like your... Your teeth are in transition. I wouldn't say they're rebuilt. They're certainly not rebuilding. <laughs> <laughs> Nate. Ah, ah. That is a perfect <laughs> note to end the podcast on. Guys, this is a draft class where there's a lot of... Uh, the floors and the ceilings, everything's promising. I actually really love this class regardless of the trade at the top that ate up most of the show. What I do know is that next year is not going to be the thing that we all think it's going to be or that the national media might think it's going to be, which is interesting because next week we have 
the schedule release. Allegedly. Is oh, that, yeah. Who do you have on? Allegedly, the, guest next the week? schedule release. is Thursday. Any it's guesses? Thursday. Uh, on the on the on the uh, wait on the schedule or the guest? Guest. You have probably been on their show, and they love wrestling. It's not yeah. hard to figure out. And Anthony Proaska. <laughs> we're gonna sit here and we're gonna, we're gonna we're gonna rap about the NFL schedule, and I guarantee you, there's gonna be a wave of primetime games. And it's going to be hilarious to watch the Bills in a transition year. It's going to look a lot like the time the Miami Dolphins made the playoffs and then got handed six primetime games the next year and just fell on their face. <laughs> it's going to be a lot like the time that Drew went to the orthodontist and he was like, ah. <laughs> ah, I've guys, never seen anything like this before. <laughs> guys, it's been a lot of fun. It's been a lot of fun getting Nate hammered and just yelling about things off Seagram's. But for tonight, we got to get out of here. I've had a lot of fun just kind of giving an overview Go of the Go get class, a mango peach Mildly culture. talking about By it because way. it's all I really care about. Now it's time to get these guys in camp, let the bullets start flying, and figure out who actually matters. I think there's going to be some... I think there's going to be some surprises. The way the roster's built as to what's going to matter when camp starts and who's going to come out on top. Mm. But we have a whole summer to debate that. For tonight, we got to get out of here. I'm Drew here. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> All right, oh. right Shay Shay. Oh. All right, Shay Shay. I'm Drew Gear. That's Chris Krueger. That's Nick Geary. And I'm the captain. He's the captain of the SS bullshit. And this has been your Rock Pile Report.